Our Zululand hunt so far had been a mix of disappointment and extreme satisfaction as most good hunting trips are. In the days leading up we had seen some really nice kudu bulls in, in, a, in big bachelor herds of like eight or nine animals at a time. We just hadn't got an opportunity on them. They were either too far in, in a situational position where we didn't feel comfortable taking the shot or they just moved away too quickly. We had managed to quite spontaneously take down an Impala Ram that was fairly old um, after a lot of hard work in the morning trying to get the kudu so I guess it was compensation for some hard work. We'd also tried to get a common reed buck but had seen everything but the animal we wanted to see which is kind of typical of, of hunting. And then at the end of the day, after a lot of ups and downs, we'd obviously managed to get two really nice bush pig boars. One of them that was quite large with the, with the 260 Remington and the thermal, which was awesome. So three animals down, no one can complain about that. But we still hadn't got the species that I had really wanted to get. Nice kudu bull and the common reed buck, which we don't really find in the part of the country where I'm from. So that was the main aim for the the next part of our hunt. So on day three we pulled out all the stops and we hit it really hard. Despite getting to bed very late the previous night, we were up at 4am and heading down into the valley long before sunrise to set up an ambush. In theory it was the perfect prologue to a brilliant hunting story. The nice thing about an, an ambush situation is that you have time. So we'd identified a, a part of the farm where we, we knew there'd been a lot of kudu activity. It's the same spot where we had seen that large bachelor herd a, a couple of days earlier. And so in preparation for a potential long shot, I found a nice position to lie down prone, got all my equipment out, ranged various points on the opposite hill so that I knew more or less what I would have to dial for each of them. When I hunt, I don't pursue long range shots for the sole purpose of taking a long range shot. It's an arrow in my quiver, so to speak, in that if I get an opportunity at long range and the animal doesn't come close, I'm actually able to take it. We knew with absolutely no wind on that day, anything within, let's say 700 or 800 meters would be going down. The Kudu has a pretty large vital zone uh, we're shooting 208 grain Hornady ELDMs at, at pretty good speeds out of 300 WSM. So they would cut through the, the air pretty well. They wouldn't drop too much and they would hit with some authority. Right, so it's our second morning of hunting here. Um, got up nice and early, we got up at four to make sure we get out here before the sun rises. Cause you know, you know, as soon as the sun starts coming up, as soon as it's getting, starts getting light, the kudu are gonna start moving. Um, and finding spots where they can sun themselves. This is how I like to hunt, having some time to set up, um, not having to rush anything and take a, a, a hurried shot. Let's see what happens. A lot of people have the impression that long range hunting is lobbing bullets at animals and just shooting till you can hit them. Um, obviously people differ to myself. If I've got an animal that's a distance off, the measures you take to ensure that you'll get a, a good hit or clean miss, you get the animal facing in the direction of the wind, you dial for the anticipated wind, you're either hitting it behind the shoulder, if you got the wind wrong, you're going onto the shoulder, if you've got it completely wrong, um, you're going off the front. That's a clean miss, there's nothing in it. We had our tracker with us, we had obviously Nico and myself, so between the three of us, we, were, we had eyes on, on every possible spot. The three of us were glassing all the time. No kudu showed up, and unfortunately, as the morning progressed and as it started to get lighter and heat up, you know, in the time when you would normally see movement of kudu through that area, um, we saw some Nyala, we saw some Impala, but not a single kudu. And after just sitting there for a few hours, we realized that we actually had to change tactics. Otherwise, we were gonna, we were gonna lose a whole morning of, of good hunting. We sat there most of the morning, uh, spotted plenty of Nyala, 
plenty of impala. Um, saw some kuri cows, but the bulls are just nowhere to be seen. Um, yeah, we limited time to hunt. The weather prediction saying it would be going close to 40 degrees Celsius for the day. 39 was the prediction. And um, yeah, so we set up. We knew we'd probably only have till about 10 o'clock before it'd just be too hot to hunt. This tactic didn't seem like it was going to work. And even though it's called the Vapor Trail Series, we, if conditions don't allow it, we don't go out and sit and for hours and just wait for long range shots. If, they, if they're not on, if the conditions aren't right for them, you have to adapt and, and do what the conditions uh, press you to do. And basically what it came down to is that we had to keep moving. But as we started moving around, we just had to grin and bear it. It started getting very hot, but we spotted a couple groups of kudu on, on different spots in the valley and um, the one group we spotted uh, we sat and glassed at for a while but we only saw kudu cows um, no bulls in the group but we did get some awesome scope cam footage of those of those cows just to to show you how clear that nexus is with the scope cam on and then a little bit later maybe half an hour later we spotted one kudu bull that was quite young you could see it had quite a thin neck and it wasn't the, the sort of animal that we were wanting to go after but we decided to follow it anyway just in case there may have been uh, more shootable kudu bulls just on the other side of the hill we put on a bit of a stalk uh, put the rifle over my shoulder Nico grabbed the camera started hiking up a very steep hill it was so steep that the dog actually couldn't get up <laughs> and we felt a few times that if we slipped we'd probably tumble all the way down to the bottom but we kept on going in the heat got to the top and absolutely nothing the gray ghost of africa had ghosted us once again and we had to trudge all the way back down to the truck empty-handed well i'll tell you what gets me it's not it's not the fact that we have to to walk far it's the i mean look how steep we are we have to you know if you sp spot some kudu it's a walk up one of these hills the hill just seems to never end because you've got these little uh terraces that go up and every time you're over a terrace there's another one above you i think we're gonna call it a, a morning and uh, see if we can get something else somewhere else that might be a little bit easier to get the kudu is kind of like the the main goal because they they're such special animals and to get a big bull kudu is, is is really cool but yeah it's uh that's hunting sometimes you just don't get them with the heat beginning to get pretty unbearable we decided to take a break and head to a part of the farm that holds quite a lot of uh, historical significance. Many, many years ago, early 1800s, the part of the country where I'm from switched from Dutch rule to British rule and became the British Cape Colony. And when that happened, a lot of the Dutch farmers that were in the area decided they didn't want to be under British rule. They wanted their own um, part of the country where they could farm and just live a normal peaceful free life so they packed up their stuff and they moved north in what was called the great trek and one of those groups led by a man named Petra Tiff ended up going north around the Drakensberg mountains and down into what is now um, KwaZulu Natal and um, back then it was um, inhabited by the Zulu people and the Zulu people were led by a man named Dingan and these two completely different cultures met um, both great leaders Petra Tiff and King Dingaan they had a few discussions um, Petra Tiff wanted to buy land from the Zulus they were about to make an agreement and to cut a long story short um, it, the confrontation ended up with Petra Tiff and 70 of his men um, being killed and that in turn led to a few very bloody and very historically significant wars which you can also read about but we were privileged enough to actually go and see King Dingaan's cattle crawl um, and part of those buildings that you see there are actually the original buildings the floors that were made of clay they're still intact and a few hundred meters from Dingaan's cattle crawl is the grave of Petra Tiff and his 70 men and it was just a really humbling experience to actually stand on that ground where so much had happened and to see the names of of all those guys that had that had been killed about half of the surnames on that list you'll recognize from the the springbuck 
a rugby team, which just shows, you know, the long lineage of, of the Afrikaans people. And I guess also just an honor to be hunting in an area where so many great hunters had hunted before, hunters that are so much better than we will ever be. They didn't have the fancy scopes, didn't have the modern cartridges. Um, in fact, the Zulus just had their, their spears and they still managed to get stuff down and that is quite something to think about. After a short lunch, we headed back up to the higher altitude part of the farm where the temperatures are a little bit cooler, um, where it's a little bit greener to look for a reedbuck ram. Now we'd been pursuing a reedbuck ram previous few days with, with no luck. We'd seen everything but common reedbuck and it was much of the same this time around. We saw some nyala strutting through the, the thick bush on the other, opposite side of the valley. Uh, we saw zebra, we saw wildebeest, we saw daker, we saw pretty much everything you can think of. A lot of mountain reedbuck as well. But once again, after a long day, we ended up empty handed and we left scratching our heads thinking how an area which is known to have so many common reedbuck could show up with almost nothing. It was very strange. Mountain reedbuck everywhere. But the day wasn't quite over yet. We went back home, we had a quick supper, and we ended up taking out my 260 Remington once, once again with the thermal scope on top and heading out to look for a master scavenger, an animal that you will know for its laugh. <laughs> so the weeks leading up to Matt coming down, we'd had some cattle losses due to the spotted hyena that we have down in this area. And uh, I got a hold of Parks Board, organized the permit, and we thought it'd be a good chance. We'll have the thermal up anyway. We could try and call in one of these cattle killers and, and hunt one. Um, also a species that, that was high on, on, on Matt's wish list. So uh, basically, we set up in the area where we know they, they're very active. Obviously, the area where they've been catching the cattle. We'll set up there, um, take the caller. We've got a call, and you call them in, and you dispatch them like that. It's basically management of animals. We have plenty of ahina in the area. Um, on certain farms, we see their tracks every single day. You hear them most nights when you're out there, but they don't catch a cattle. Those animals are left, um, you know, undisturbed, nothing done to them. But every now and again, you get some of the older animals which battle to catch a natural prey and they start getting into, the, into in catching the cattle calves and stuff like that and uh, they can be very destructive. We had a few years ago, we lost 45 head of cattle to hyena. So now when we do have an animal like that, we remove them. Okay, so we're back at it again with some uh, thermal hunting at night. This one's even more exciting than the bush pig hunt. We're going after a master scavenger, the hyena. It's a little bit hit and miss, you never know whether they're going to come in or not, but apparently on this property the hyena have been causing problems um, eating the calves and stuff. So we're going to try put the fox pro out and see if we can and call them in. Very, very exciting and we've just checked the thermal now just on the hillside here. It literally lights up everything out to miles. You can see all the trees and everything. So if they do come in and we know which direction they come in, we should be able to follow them all the way in. Unfortunately, not a single hyena showed up, didn't see anything through the thermal, didn't even hear any uh, response calls, and we ended up packing up and going home knowing that we had another 4 a.m. start the, the next morning. So at the end of day three, it was once again the animals that had the upper hand and the hunters that went home with nothing. <laughs> you can see the hyena tracks in the road from Looks like early this morning, they still look quite fresh. Um, we traveled up and down this road yesterday and these are our tracks we left in the midday and then some more vehicles went out late afternoon and all these tracks are after that. You can see it came straight up the road. Some good sign, maybe get a chance on them a bit later. So, day four. Duh. I don't even want to talk about day four. 
Day four started off pretty much the same as, as day three, perfectly planned ambush in the same spot as the previous morning. We knew that if a kudu had shown, shown up, it would have been game over. It was such a good position. There was no wind once again. It would have been perfect, but just our luck or, or lack of luck, nothing showed up. And it's not like there weren't any kudu. You know, just a couple days before, we'd seen a massive herd of like 15 animals in one group, which is very, very rare. Um, and so many good bulls in that group. So we knew they were around. Um, it was just, they just didn't show up in that spot on that morning. And uh, I think I actually stopped filming for most of the day. Um, we were just really tired and really disheartened. And, you know, it came to a point where I didn't want to have to manage the camera and the, the battery life and the microphones and all of that. I just wanted to get that kudu down. I think the highlight of the of the day, surprisingly, was actually the lunch. We were able to pull in at the camp once again, uh, the beautiful camp in the valley, uh, put some, some more meat on, on the fire, sit in the shade, drink some water and relax a bit, which is something we, we hadn't done much of over, the, of over the past few days. I had one fleeting opportunity on a, on a reed buck towards the end of the day, a pretty nice reed buck actually. I was uh, kind of in a very awkward position but, but behind the sentinel tripod in the long grass, I could have taken him, but just as I'd set up, just as I'd pushed that bolt forward, he started bolting. And as I watched him running away through the scope, it dawned on me that this was probably the end of my hunting trip. Um, we had one more day, one more morning the next morning, but with only a few more hours of hunting left in the trip, I realized that I probably had to let go of my ambition to get this Reedbuck Ram. And to be honest, it was quite a freeing moment. I felt like just the pressure left me, the pressure that I put on myself. And from that point onward, I actually, I think I actually started enjoying being at that farm a little bit more. You know, I didn't have this thing weighing on my back that I, want, that I had to get this animal down. I was able to just let go, have, have peace, put everything down and say, it's over, let's enjoy it. And funnily enough, that's when things started turning for me. <laughs> that night, um, I said to Matt, we've hunted hard for two or three days. Let's come home, have a beer, buy some meat, just relax, take it easy. And then while we were doing that, we were actually chatting about it. And it's not all about getting the animal. It's about everything else. And we've spent a good amount of time together. We're not going to find the buck. It's a good excuse for Matt to come back again. So we were we're pretty happy that, that we had that excuse and while speaking like that I had this thing in the back of my mind that normally when you say like okay let's just go for a drive and we're not really pushing for it that's when things happen we woke up the next day with absolutely no urgency whatsoever we got up late we had a nice breakfast um, and with a few hours to go before I was supposed to head home, um, we decided, you know what, let's just go for a game drive and see what we can spot. The weather had totally changed from the previous few days. The temperature had plummeted down probably 15 to 20 degrees Celsius lower than it was the day before. Uh, it was wet, it was, there was thick fog. It looked like a completely different world that we were in. And as we started moving down into the valley and seeing animals everywhere, animals that we hadn't seen the previous few days, a th thought crept into my head. Could this be one of those typical 11th hour scenarios where everything just pulls together at the last moment? And I, I looked back behind me in the truck to make sure my rifle was with me. It was, and uh, we thought, you know what? We might just get an opportunity here. All of a sudden, seemingly out of absolutely nowhere, Nico spots something at the corner of his eye. He pulls out his, his binos and takes a look. And I hear the excitement in his voice as he said, Matt, there's your reed buck. And I was expecting it was just to be another mountain reed buck ram or something, but it was the one we were after. I look across the valley and I just see <laughs> this animal standing broadside looking right at me. This one horn out to the side, another horn facing forward, an animal with quite a lot of character. 
and take my rifle out and we start walking. We quickly had to put a stalk in on him, get him to a decent position and, and, and get a shot, but like totally un unexpected and exactly the place, same place we've been looking for, for him for three days. I said to Matt, he's either in this valley, when he's not in this valley, he's in this valley. That's where they hang out. And all the females in the mountain reed pack that have been there the day before were there again, but there he just stood. And both of us couldn't believe our eyes, but yeah, we got into shooting range, shooting position. As I started um, preparing to take the shot, he started walking off and I had to shift position once or twice. I was concerned that he might move over the top of the hill, but I, I knew that he would at least stop once or twice before he got to the position and would give me a second or two to actually take the shot. And he was within 200 meters, so I wasn't too concerned about that. Frustratingly, because we weren't expecting to hunt on that morning, I had not charged my scope cam batteries. And as I hit record, it didn't beep, and I realized the battery was flat, which I was really disappointed about. I really wanted to get that shot through the scope cam. But pulled the scope cam off, chucked it to one side, um, made sure Nico was on the animal, closed the bolt, and as he stopped at what I thought was around 200 meters away, I held a little bit higher just to be safe and squeezed off the trigger and he dropped on the spot. Yeah. Okay, when he stops again, I'm on him. You just take him when he stops. He'll stop at the top there now. Okay, he's gonna come out. There we go. Well, finally, hey. I mean, we've been out here for, I think, three days straight, just trying to find these, these reed buck. And the strange thing is, you know, Nico tells me this place is full up with reed buck here, and there's not many mountain reed buck. And we've been coming here the past few days, seeing loads of mountain reed buck and no reed buck. And it's your typical situation where everything you're not hunting is all over the place, and everything that you are hunting is just gone. Didn't have time to range, just uh, held, you know, sort of a little bit high on it and uh, took the shot and 300 put him straight down. So really, really happy with that. It's a great way to end my hunting trip here. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it looks like I hit him pretty high. But I'm just thinking now, it's probably a bit closer from here. It looks like it's a bit closer than 200 meters. And I was shooting at a bit of an incline. So I probably hit exactly where I aimed. But he went down, that's all that matters. So really happy with that. So what's nice about this ram is he's, he's got a bit of character. You can see the one horn is kind of a little bit back and, and more straight up and the other one's coming out. It'll actually look quite nice, I think with a, like a, European skull mount or something just so you can see that the character in its horns and make that stand out but yeah really happy nice old ram we worked hard for him which makes the, the feeling of getting getting him down even sweeter yeah couldn't have worked out better on the last morning eh? <laughs> and I've got some meat to take home now as well so happy with that I'd like to just first and foremost give a huge thanks to Nico uh, you guys don't see the amount of preparation he put in for this and just how organized he was when I arrived and just he's been such a good host to me and it's just been you know aside from the hunting just such a nice opportunity to to catch up as friends and to to talk about life and talk about shooting and you know that's what that's what this is all about for me so even if we hadn't got this guy I would have gone home with a smile on my face but to get him is has been uh it's been fantastic um I just want to say thanks to Splitting Image Taxidermy uh, they've also been just supporting me over the last while and are probably going to help me get this guy mounted. Super happy about that and I can go home with uh, an extra big smile on my face. It was a pretty steep hill that he was on so the retrieval wasn't too fun. But thankfully it wasn't a massive um, animal like a kudu and thankfully he wasn't too far to the road so we probably had about only a hundred meters or so 
that we had to pull him up the hill to the truck. But something pretty pretty funny happened after that, the Python incident, which it which it's now called, between the truck and the animal that we needed to take to the truck was a little piece of high grass and as Nico was walking back along the road to go to go fetch the truck I heard him scream like a little girl and it turns out his foot was probably a few centimeters away from a massive python that was obviously uh, out in the, the sun trying to to heat up you could see the rain the rain droplets <laughs> all over its back it was obviously quite cold and I think it's a good thing that it was cold otherwise it, it might have felt a bit more freedom to get its butt into gear and strike it at uh, Nico, in which case I would probably have to come and rescue him. <laughs> but uh, that was that was pretty funny. Do you want to tell me what just happened, Nico? I <laughs> <laughs> stepped on a python. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to slip down and fall on top of him, eh? <laughs> I was standing right next to him with a little bramble coming down, <laughs> trying to sort out the bramble, and the next thing I just saw that. Fastest 10 meters of my life. <laughs> <laughs> we now have to try and move the python out the road because there's the truck down there and there's the python and we don't want to drive over him so Nico's got the fun job of having to poke the snake. <laughs> it became Nico's job to fetch a stick and slowly prod it to get it moving out the way and we heard it exhaling. As a, as a warning to us, which sounded like a tire being deflated. It was a pretty scary sound. And I said to him, well, we need to move it to drive there. And I'm scared of snakes, so I'm not moving it. And um, Matt says, well, he's also scared of snakes. He's not moving it either. And we get up onto this embankment so it can't get us. And we're standing there throwing little clots down because it's not moving and it's so cold. And we didn't know if it was dead or just cold. That's a big flipping python, eh? He also, decided to strike at Nico a few times, which was pretty funny to watch. Um, but eventually, after putting up a bit of a resistance, he moved off on his way and we were able to drive past. After the Python experience, got the Reedbuck loaded onto the van. Um, Matt still had to, to leave uh, the same afternoon. So we got it to the skinning shed, being one of Matt's, like, species he really wanted to hunt we did a nice cape on it got it salted got it in the freezer and um, quickly started optimizing the meat we basically just broke the animal into big pieces that it was still very fresh and we just took out a section of backstrap um, something I wanted to show Matt um, they called Kalahari prawns they're not prawns at all it's actually venison meat um, you'll see we, we did the uh, I've showed where we cut the meat up and we prepare it with garlic herb barbecue spice and then you basically put it in some flour, egg, and, and just deep fry them till they're medium rare. I will put that in a separate little uh, Vapor Trails bonus cooking episode for you. Uh, we filmed the whole thing, show you how to, how to make some Kalahari prawns, and um, that'll be something that you will see in a later video. So what ended up being a pretty uneventful last few days of the hunt, in fact, we probably would have had to scrap this entire video if we hadn't got anything down, um, ended up being quite fruitful. Goes to show, often pushing hard is not the way and just letting happen what happens is the best way in the end it will work out right if it's, if it's meant to be, you know. At the end of the day, it, it wasn't those kind of longer range shots that we wanted for the Vapor Trail series. I know it's kind of supposed to be a long range hunting series, but uh, beggars can't be choosers. And, you know, when, when hunting in Africa, you are beggars. Um, there's no easy way to do it. Often when you get to a hunting trip, you've got a list this long of, of things you want to do. Um, it needs to be this and it needs to be that and I want this and I want that. And especially in Zululand where you work hard for your animals, the longer you, the further you walk, the shorter the list becomes. So eventually like two, three days into the hunt, the list just says read back. And you're not even sure if it's a male or a female anymore. You're just willing to take whatever the felt gives you. And that just shows you um, the way hunting can go. And you need to appreciate it and, and take it for what it is. Um, there are so many places now um, where you can just hunt animals on demand, just pay for it and get what you want and they're there in little paddocks and it's not really hunting. We, you like to hunt 
true wild areas where you can get anything or nothing it can go either way that's the real pursuit of hunting and 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 what it's all about you know being willing to take the chance and putting in all the effort and doing all the preparation just to come home empty-handed and still have enjoyed it so much that you'd be willing to just go back and do it again you know? it was a massive honor and privilege to get to explore and experience and and hunt a part of the country that was a first for me so regardless of the outcome it would have been and has been an experience that i will remember and cherish for the rest of my life